Hey, everybody, it's Ken McElroy here again. I'm with my good buddy, Tom Hatton. Hey, Tom. How you doing, Ken? So Tom and I have known each other a long time. Uh, we're in YPO together. We were in EO together. Uh, we've got lots of mutual friends together, and uh, we get together from time to time. He's a very busy guy. He's got a, a rags to riches story, just like a lot of us and just like myself. And, and Tom, uh, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, and also, I want to chat about your new book, Dream On. So I can't wait to uh, get, dig into that a little bit. So, uh, well, let's talk about your story because I, I was always intrigued with that. Obviously, uh, we had property in Ahwatukee, yeah, not just down the road. And I think that story um, is the epitome of an entrepreneur. You know what I mean? When you were like sitting there and you go, well, what about this? You cut the deal. You even, I think the guy even got bought your, your, your equipment. Yeah, yeah, there was... Uh... That was just a really kind of a magical time, if you can even use that term, when the opportunity just kind of presented itself with the right people, and and I was pretty hungry. Yeah. Yeah, but did, didn't you go to the owner of the the, the center? Yeah. And uh, which was called Mountainside Plaza. Yeah. And I, I asked him to. He did all the TIs. He invested seventy thousand. I was twenty two years old, so with no balance sheet, no credit, That's nothing. Awesome. You know, I had a car loan, and he invest. He put in seventy thousand on the TIs, and then uh, he paid for the sign. Our actual sign on the building and then help me with some of the equipment. He ended up giving me a loan uh, for like 10 grand that he never asked for back when I wanted to pay him back. He said, don't pay me back. How great is that? Yeah. He had lost the center to um, at that time. They needed to be 92% lease when, uh, when uh, the, oh, his boy, it was 1993 when that crash happened and he was at 88% with two leases in tow and they said, Nope, we're taking the center back. Oh, so he wow. goes, don't worry about paying me the 10 grand. I'm like, That's, oh, wow. I don't think I knew that. Yeah. So from there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about that first year, because I, I don't think I dug in on that. Now, now, how many how many members do you have? Well, we have eighteen locations, fourteen hundred employees, and uh, and just under a hundred thousand members. Yeah. Insane. Yeah. Good. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So let's talk about that first year. Yeah, that was. I, I remember not sleeping. <clears throat> that was not part of the deal then, and then trying to figure out how to run a business because I'd never had done that before. How to be a, a boss. Um, how to understand what it meant to build a culture and a product. And all that was happening simultaneously while trying to um, work on the side. I still painted houses on the side because I couldn't draw any money out of the business. Um, and because the business was open 17 hours a day, there wasn't a lot of downtime. So it was just an interesting time, but it was so full of energy. There was just a lot of good things happening all the time. And I think that's what kind of fueled getting through all that. Good things happen in gyms. You know, people are generally trying to be healthy. And so I would imagine that's a pretty cool environment. It is. And back when I started, it wasn't nearly like it is today. You know, the, the world changed in fitness right in the you know early 2000s. And uh, it was more of a, could it be a fad? Is this a real business kind of a thing? But people were happy. And I think if we created a culture that made people feel comfortable and it wasn't just about how you looked, it was about how you felt. I think that was part of the basis of our culture and how we've been able to grow. So thank you for that. Um, I know, uh, you know, then you started to expand. Obviously, you're like, okay, this works. So let's <laughs> yeah. go to two. Let's go to three. And now you have 18. Yeah. Um, and most of that you've done on your own, right? You That's have some correct. investors on the real estate along the way. Yeah, we have built about 25 altogether. Some have moved or, you know, I moved out because the leases were up and stuff. But uh, it, I learned pretty quick when I was so young that nobody was really going to keep allowing me to build bigger clubs because our balance sheet just wasn't big enough. Uh, so it was uh, probably about five years after I opened, four years after I started looking at SBA loans and seeing if I could do that in, in owner occupied deals. And it did, it worked 1996. I did my first uh, SBA loan. So about five years after I opened the, my first you know, club um, and built an 18,000 square foot club on two and a half acres and got a million dollar SBA loan. Nice. And that's changed the game because yeah. then I did, I started to learn about sale leasebacks and that's what my partner was, you know, it was really the real estate equity yeah. flipping into another yeah. deal. Yeah. That's a really smart because the SBA is a small business administration and they have these loans right. that they give uh, up and coming entrepreneurs. But I think the rule is you have to own, you have to occupy 51%. 51% of the building and not, and then have more than uh, a majority share of the operation. Right. Right. right which yeah. you did. So which I did that became your model. That became growth. my model. Yeah. It was interesting. It's something I learned from my father when we were growing up with, with houses, he would live, we'd live in a house and then he would go, that's enough of this. And he would sell it and trade up. And that's yeah. the way we kind of did it. And I'm like, well, this can kind of work in, in my business. And it was easier because we, I always say the company was the talent. So we always had that tenant ready to go in there. And then that tenant would stay and we would define, you know, define that lease and then I'd sell it 
right, sell right. the building and that worked and the tenant stayed. So fast forwarding today now, so you have the, the real estate, right? And then you have the mountainside uh, uh, business, right? That kind of occupies the real estate. Is that how it's all set up? It's what, how it was all set up. And okay. then, um, you know, probably a lot of the emphasis on the book with a life changing kind of thing in 2008 happened. We were building six clubs, three in Arizona and three in Colorado all at the same time. Oh, wow. And, and a whole bunch of, you know, stuff going on with that and how he, you know, got the debt and yep. all this kind of stuff. And when everything came crashing down, when all that kind of the dust settled, it took about four years uh, for all to settle. That was it. I was done. I kept one building just uh, because it had a lot of meaning that I talk about in this book. But everything else I sold, you know, off. And said, "That's it. We're we're done owning real estate because that was just its own functioning beast on it, and it was out of my control how values would go and those things. And I didn't want that anymore. I just wanted to have the business and know how that would work. So that's like the perfect segue for <laughs> for where we are right now, uh, yeah. right? Because what's happening in my space is there's a lot of people going out and expanding like you did." And they never had, never, never been through a correction, you know, and they're, mm -hmm. they're getting bank loans and they're getting equity and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, um, I've been through it too, as you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. so you got all the way down to one property, right? One that I own. Yeah. One that, that you own back in 2012. Yeah, I kept right. that one. I bought that one. Uh, we built, uh, short story here, we built, we, we were into it for a total of $23 million. It appraised at 27 the day we broke ground. A year later, we completed the project, and it was 2009. That same valuation came in at $14 million. Yeah. And then it fell all the way to eight. It can, this can happen, folks. I, you know, like, <laughs> it was right? insane. Tom, I mean, you've been through it. I've been through this, you yeah. know, and I think what's happened is, you know, a lot of the people listening here, um, you know, are real estate folks or entrepreneurs and, and uh, a lot of the guys like you have been through it. You just come into this next cycle a little bit more wise. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Those scars are still there. Yeah. And and how all that worked and, and you know, how many people were affected down line, whether it was banks, businesses and, and so, you know, you name it, people just in general, you know, my best friend killed himself. So, oh, I mean, no. it was the it was everything that you can imagine that could come out of all that turmoil happened. Yeah. That's horrible. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Um, so what did you learn from, you know, losing everything, almost losing everything? Yeah, I think, you know, I actually ended up at one point filing four bankruptcies. They're all LLC chapter 11s. I, I uh, finished it all off right before my birthday in 2000, I think 12, uh, filing my own chapter 11, because at that point I had just under a hundred million dollars in personal guarantees on real estate. Oof. So just say that out loud, right? Uh, so that had to happen. So that kind of just put everything at the baseline of, you know, what was going wrong in the, in the economy was truly affecting, you know, certainly me. And, and I was trying not to let it affect the business because it was just a real estate issue. That was tough. And it, it it is a tough. lot of lessons learned. Dude, I've been time. there. I tell you, I, I talk a lot about these personal guarantees with people. They don't understand. So you may know, um, I think we've talked about this before, but I have no personal guarantees anymore, anymore <laughs> on anything on $800 million worth of stuff. It's beautiful. Yeah. And because of that, you know, because mm -hmm. of having gone through that, you go in and I think what's happening right now is that I, I just talked to a guy yesterday, you know, he's doing, um, he's, he's, uh, he sold priceline.com mm, yeah. and, um, you know, they're doing mes lending and all this kind of lending. I'm like, dude, like you gotta be careful because you know, like, like this is, this is recourse debt. They're going to come after you and trust me though. They will. They will. And, um, you know, those real estate values, uh, are, he, he was doing it in Austin, Texas. I'm like, Austin's pretty hot right now. So, so, you know, uh, those real estate values can go up and down pretty quickly. When you were talking about those valuations uh, of $27 million and went down to 14, right? That happened in just a few months, probably 12 months. Yeah. So people don't haven't been, a lot of people haven't been through this cycle yet. I think it's a very, very important lesson. And thank you for bringing it up because it's a lot of people don't talk about that pain and those scars and, and those, the, you know, I call them, you know, little hurdles, you know? Yeah, little hurdles. <laughs> yeah. I hope people don't have memory loss. You yeah. Know? Cause I feel like that, especially in this state where we are back rolling again and you know, our growth is so much determined on credit and certainly housing. Um, it's a little bit tweaked nowadays, I think, but, um, with that, I hope people have, 
Yeah. You know, well, real congratulations. Good <laughs> and then, so really, you've grown to 18 locations in six years. Yeah, I, th- I think that we really hit our stride again in 2012 when the when the dust settled. I sold my clubs in Colorado. I had you know the ones here that we had opened up, and then we said, okay, we're through this. Let's let's go, and, and we went differently. There was a different route that we took to kind of get where we are today. Certainly a lot more solid, you know, definitely based on the business. Certainly increasing the brand and so forth. And I think that was the big game changer. You know, learning everything from yeah. eight to nine, where I was super aggressive and didn't ever think something would happen like it did. Now that still plays in my mind and we go at it a different way. Good for way. you. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how I approach things now too. Is We were just had our investor conference, as I was telling you yeah. last week. And these guys are like, when are you going to buy more deals? And I said, guys, we are peaking <laughs> or not, <laughs> right? Sometimes the best thing is to say no. I know. It's hard say though. No, it's it hard. is. But all these people, you see these cranes and everything going. I see your gyms all over the place. And congratulations on just Thank you. incredible brand you've built, incredible culture. 1,400 employees. Um, that's not an easy thing to do. Thanks. Um, what what is the what what is the best thing about owning a gym? You know, and, and the the facilities that you have. I think it's the culture. I think it really became we really lucky because a lot of things happened either through the through just social media, certainly through the crash, and then evolution of good uh, health is it became a mainstream business, a real business. And um, and I say because of the crash, because big boxes started to die and retailers started to die, Amazon started to grow and so on. So that left you know major boxes and available to grow into. It created different health club models, but it also said, hey, it's a sustainable thing. People want this. They want to go to uh, you know health clubs and do that. So I think that progression's been really nice to the sustainability of the business. And then to know if you do it right, where people truly look at it, like in the crash, what we learned is that, man, it's their stress reliever. It's their place. It's their place so they can bring their kids, that kids have fun, or they can just say, hey, I'm just going to get away from everything for a minute while, you know, I'm in a class or, you know, working out. What are you guys doing differently in the club? Because I tell you what, here locally in, in Arizona, you're definitely heads above any other club. Well, thank you. I think what we learned a long time ago through the for the first days when I opened up the you know my first little club is how do we create uh, pack as much value as we can in the box. So we don't really sell price. You know, I don't sell high end. You know, let's say tennis courts or swimming pools. What we'll do is say on a forty thousand square foot box, how can we make it feel like the highest end facility in the United States by the way it looks. How can we give you the kind of amenities that you would get if you went to a specialty yoga or, you know, a high performance, you know, club with just strength equipment. So we've kind of smashed all that together into this box that looks and feels very high end, but gives you all these different amenities, plus a 4,000 square foot child care that we change diapers and, you know, right. done all that stuff to where we say, man, for $44, this feels like I'm getting a deal every day that I walk in. Is that what it is now? 44 bucks? Yep. 44 times highest price <laughs> that's it that's our top of it it goes down from there you know if it's couples less stuff like that that's families insane. are less well think about yeah. that 44 dollars times a hundred thousand people yeah it's okay not bad it's not bad job, not buddy. bad thank you no it's good um so what uh you know what are some of the downsides of of owning a gym well, I think in this day and age, it's, it's funny. There's not a day or a week I, I that doesn't go by that I don't worry about liability. You know, when you when you're smaller, you know, it's kind of right out in front of you. But now, when there's so much going on, I mean, we'll well, it's like today. Today's Wednesday, right? So we'll put in, I don't know, twenty two thousand workouts today. Will happen through the clubs. Wow. So that's twenty two thousand possibilities. Yes. Not to mention the kids and the child care, yeah. which we average about seventy five an hour in there. So you think of all the moving parts that could go wrong. You know, that's what kind of keeps me up at night. Now, thankfully, we've done great with, with all that. your folks. Yeah, with all too. the folks. Yeah. So, uh, and we keep the facilities really maintained and clean, but that's a worry. Yeah. People getting injured. So, you know, we talk about, a lot about this reoccurring revenue model. That, right. How great is that? Now, that's financeable. That's financeable. You bet. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, you know, the old days where it used to be a contract, now it's an agreement, right? Yep. So people can cancel, but it is a subscription base. But that's everything Netflix, the HBO, and that's the way the world is. We Health clubs were in front of it. Yeah. Thankfully, uh, it just takes a lot of bodies, especially if you have a, you know, more expensive building to, to get to that break even. But once you do, it's really nice. You know, it's interesting. Um, when I, in my apartment business, um, I used to go to health clubs and hire the salespeople. Ah, smart. Well, because they were always amazing. They they were always incredibly well-trained. 
And and so you guys, uh, honestly, the health club business has been way ahead of the curve, in my opinion, in many, many, many ways. It's it's interesting. We we try to sell information based on the product. So when you come on in, you see everything that's in front of you, and then we're going to inform you of all the things that you're going to get. And then along the way, you're being sold. So yeah. it's not feeling like we're out in your face, you know, selling you. We're yeah. doing it through a process the whole way through. Um, and I think that's worked really well for us. You know, we have a good closing percentage when people come in, uh, we have a good prospect percentage. And then I think uh, everybody's kind of, everybody's a salesperson in there. Like literally from my main maintenance guys to the girls in the childcare to the, my instructors, they're selling right. all the time and not right. necessarily because they're saying that, but because of the way they're functioning. Yeah, for sure. Well, I do want to talk to you in the next podcast about your book dream on because, um, we talked a lot about this when yep. you were writing it and there's a lot of incredible stories in here. So, uh, with that, Tom, uh, thank you for You're this welcome. interview. And, uh, I want to dig into the book next. You bet. Thank you.